started, I want to introduce the person who is responsible for the day-to-day -day work of the caucus, Kathleen Strotman, who is the executive director of the Congressional Caucus, but who has built it over the last 10 years. And prior to that, was it prior to 10 years that you were on the st on Senator Landrell's staff? So talk about an expert, not just on adoption, not just on uh, foster youth, but actually on both of those issues from an international as well as national perspective. So join me in welcoming Kathleen. Thank you. Welcome to the 2012 Foster Youth Intern Briefing. The FII program, now in its 10th year, has provided over 120 young leaders an opportunity to use their voice as interns on Capitol Hill. While the impact of this program has had on in interns, members of Congress, and federal policymaking as a whole is immeasurable, I have just a few impressive statistics to share with you this afternoon. FYIs have produced five legislative reports and 10 congressional briefings, bringing to light such issues as the overuse of psychotropic medication, the lack of educational equity, the importance of permanency and human connections, and the need for greater support post-emancipation. Uh, they've provided 125 specific policy recommendations presented to the federal policymakers, and at least three have been enacted into law. 47% of foster youth interns have gone on to pursue graduate, law, and doctoral degrees. 60% of the FYIs are now engaged in careers in social service, child welfare, and policy. I'm holding in my hand today uh, the now released um, 2012 report, Hear Me Now. Uh, today's vignettes that you'll be hearing from the young people will be uh, shortened versions, if you will, of the more full reports that they have provided for you. The most challenging piece of being in foster care was being separated from my sisters. Hear me now. I didn't experience abuse until my first foster home. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. I waited 12 years to go home to my reservation. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. Foster children are prescribed psychotropic medications at 13 times the rate of non-foster children. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. Fifteen years ago, the system took my brother from me. Today, I still don't know him. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. Nineteen years is still waiting for permanency. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. With support, foster youth are able to realize their fullest potential. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. By the time I was 19, I had moved 21 times. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. I didn't start school until I was nine. With support, I was able to graduate on time. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. Last year, only 12% of foster youth reported receiving any kind of mentoring services. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. I graduated from Harvard without the support of ETV and Chafee funds. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. My only goal while in foster care was to emancipate. Hear, Hear me, me now. now. Between the ages of 13 and 18, I was in 30 group homes and institutions. I realize it's not that you guys didn't care, it's because you guys didn't know. Hear me now. Hear us now. We felt lost in the system. Hear us now. We have something to say. Hear us now. We unite as one voice. Hear us now when foster care can't, placements can be prevented. For example, when a parent makes poor choices due to the lack of childcare, or when parents simply don't know how to address the needs of their children. As a single mother of a beautiful three-year-old girl, I know firsthand the challenges of being a new parent. And I'm sure many of you in the audience who have the privilege of being parents have struggled with similar issues. Here is the difference. Many of us who are good parents are so because we have the resources to make good choices and because we know how to make good choices. I, for one, have an amazing woman in my life who I can turn to whenever I'm struggling. Some families are not as lucky as we are. Last year, I was working with a young woman whom I had lived with when I was in foster care. She was my foster sister. 
She was a new mother who had no family support. The only people she had in her life were the staff from Casa Pacifica, a residential treatment center and shelter home for abused and neglected children, who also has a program to coach independence and transitional age youth. One night she called me hysterically, hysterically crying because her nine-month-old daughter would not stop screaming and crying. And this young mother truly did not know what to do. <coughs> Long story short, I was able to take care of the baby that night and give the mother a much needed break. Had this young woman not had the courage to call me and ask for help, that baby could have ended up in foster care. Being a parent is hard. And unfortunately, it is the children who pay for the mistakes of the parents. But rather than separating families and spending up to $72,000 per year per child, let's reform how money is spent within child welfare and utilize those funds to support families in staying together. After all, in the year 2010, 51% of children who exited foster care were reunified with their families. All of us who are up here were removed from our biological families for the sake of our well-being but I don't think any of us will sit here and say that life in foster care was easy. In fact, the reason why we are sitting before you today is because things were so challenging for us. We want to ensure that children who are coming after us have a better experience. So when you think about the future and the decisions that you will make as members of Congress, I ask that you please take more consideration for the importance of family support before foster care placement. Thank you. I was not abused until my first foster home. I remember being forced to sleep in a different room from my siblings. I remember always feeling hungry and never being fed. I remember being forced to stand in the corner of my room for hours as punishment for trying to see my brother and sister. After nine months, we were removed and eventually placed into a loving home. Although my story has a happy ending of being adopted, Thousands of children suffer from maltreatment in foster care, much of which goes unreported. In fact, my colleagues and I conducted a survey of 278 former foster youth about their experience in care. Over 55% experienced mental abuse, over 35% experienced physical abuse, over 31% experienced neglect, and approximately 12% experienced malnutrition all well in care. Maltreatment in foster care is a reality. One could deduce that the quality of care is dependent on the quality of caregiver. There are currently not enough high quality foster parents. About one in four children in, the, in care are still in need of a foster home. For this reason, it is imperative that the federal government increase foster parent recruitment expand the foster parent screening process, and provide more support for foster parent retention. First, social marketing is an effective tool for influencing human behavior. An important aspect of social marketing is the extensive research done on the target audience prior to launching the campaign. The federal government should consider encouraging states to first research characteristics of foster parents, and then incorporate a social marketing campaign into their recruitment plan. Second, there are two gaps in the foster parent screening process. The first is that states do not require candidates to complete a drug test or professional psychological screening. These could prove helpful in screening out low quality foster parents and federal policies should consider encouraging states to include these exams. Another gap is the lack of a national foster parent licensing database. The current system allows abusive parents to relocate to a different state and be relicensed, as long as the investigation did not yield any criminal charges. There needs to be a national database to track all foster parents for states to use and screen out previously abusive and neglectful foster parents. Finally, Many high quality foster parents become disengaged because of the lack of support services. Foster parenting is a difficult task and one that requires extensive training on children with trauma. The current training requirements are insufficient. 
I believe that increased training will empower foster parents to handle difficult situations. However, there will still be especially difficult incidences that occur where even foster parents with sufficient training will not know what to do. The federal government should consider creating a national 24-7 crisis hotline, which would serve as an empowerment tool to support those who feel incapable in a moment of crisis. My siblings and I were blessed to be removed from our abusive foster home. However, the other foster children in the home did not get saved. Shortly after my siblings and I were removed due to suspected abuse and neglect, a two-year-old drowned in the toilet in the same foster home. Please consider these recommendations. Thank you, Congresswoman Karen Bass and Senator Landry for your powerful voice and your leadership in foster care. It's greatly appreciated. My name is Daryl Conquering Bear Crow. I'm an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe located in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. I'm a 24-year-old Lakota man that is still finding and learning about his cultural roots. I'm an older brother of five siblings. I'm an inspiring basketball coach. I'm a product of a failed system who failed to follow the law a law that was passed to protect me and my connection to my tribe. I grew up off the reservation and was placed in various non-Indian group homes, a juvenile detention center, and foster homes. Non-Indian group homes that didn't allow me to have contact with my siblings nor with my relatives. Life was a struggle and I emancipated at the age of 18 to a world of unknown. I believe that if the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978 was followed, I would not have waited 12 years, 12 years to go home. It is a blessing that in three days, I will return home to those sacred tribal grounds and begin to give back to the community that I should have grown up in. I'm looking forward to what the Creator has blessed me with and what the path is in store for me. This morning, I had the opportunity to interact with over 200 young Native American youth coming to DC. The one thing I took from them was the power of language. I had three young men stand up and introduce themselves in Lakota and Navajo. It was powerful to me as I missed out on knowing the language myself. I wish it was taught to me when I was in foster care. Last year, 700 young Native kids were taken from their homes and are still waiting to be reunited with their families. Today is not about my story. It's about those young kids waiting, waiting to return home. There is a lot of publicity in the media about the Indian Child Welfare Act, how it isn't working. But lawmakers like you, 34 years ago, made a decision, a good decision that resulted in the law to protect Indian kids. As a nation, this law has not been wholeheartedly embraced. I would say that it's time for Congress to use the power to ensure it's being followed in all states. Accountability through the children Family service reviews will change people's lives, not just for generations to come. As Lakota people, we have a belief, a belief that we cannot just think about ourselves, our kids, and even our grandkids, but we think seven generations ahead of us and do good for those who are yet to be born, who have yet to come. I challenge you, my respected senators, my respected elders, and respected leaders in the room, to ensure that this is no longer okay for the law to be ignored and to think about those generations ahead who need your leadership to ensure that no Indian child is left behind. Thank you. Foster youth are often inappropriately misdiagnosed, over-medicated, and lack access to qualified trauma-informed therapists. Unfortunately, Medication is the preferred form of treatment because it is seen as less expensive or it is a convenience to the caregivers. Medications are being used as a chemical restraint to sedate children and prevent them from acting out. When this happens, it could ca cause harm to the youth by altering their brain chemistry in a negative way. The very system that is put in place to rescue children from abuse is in fact committing the very thing they are supposed to be protecting. The deficiency in care for foster children and mental health is staggering. A study found that 41% of children in foster care were given three or more psychotropic medications within a single month. Imagine, you are a child 
who has been abused at home. You are then placed into the foster care system, move somewhere temporarily, and then bounce from one unfamiliar placement to another. You have no family, no stability, and no voice. I bet you you'd be sad, angry, and depressed too. It is entirely normal and natural to have these emotions in such circumstances, but when we look at the DSM-4, which is the manual for diagnosing, this is not a normal reaction. It is a mental disorder. This type of diagnosing takes place every day in the foster system because of the lack of qualified therapists. Therapists are not always trained in the typical foster youth experiences and care, which makes it easier for therapists to misdiagnose youth. The traumatic experiences of foster youth are so complex that they are easily misdiagnosed as being the same symptoms as severe mental disorders, such as symptoms as restlessness, insomnia, procrastination, oh, the child has ADHD, check. Feelings of worthlessness, guilt, feeling hopeless, sad or empty, oh, the child must be bipolar, check. Instead of spending extra time to find out that the child may be having difficulties coping from being ripped away from everything he or she has ever known. Children are learning very quickly that a pill will solve every problem. Oh, you have a problem sleeping, here's a pill for that. You can't focus, here's a pill for that. The only reason why these children will think this way is because the foster system is teaching them this. This is alarming because children will grow up to think medication solves everything, eventually leading kids into a life cycle of drug dependency. Once they leave the system and their medical coverage is reduced or terminated, they fall victim to illegal drugs and or alcohol to self-medicate. I have had many peers who have had this happen to them. They have children of their own, end up in prison for drug use, and have those children taken from them, and the cycle repeats itself. These outcomes perpetuate an endless cycle of dependency. Child welfare agencies need to understand that they will end up paying far more in the long term for failing to address this issue. My recommendation to help decrease the frequency of misdiagnosis and over-medication of foster youth is to enact a federal law that will encourage state governments to require child welfare systems to hire and train qualified therapists. Second, they should require state child welfare agencies to obtain a second opinion from a qualified doctor that is anonymous to the prescribing doctor to, el to eliminate any bias. Third. Congress should require that state child welfare agencies obtain informed consent from the individual youth before prescribing psychotropic medications. Before you, you leave here today, when you think of foster children, do not think of them as someone else's child, but think of them as your own. So thank you for listening to me today. The silence has been broken and the voices have been heard. Thank you. Faith, one of the many things that my adoptive mother and grandmother have taught me to value. Faith in God, faith in family, and faith in the true beauty that lies within all of us. She taught me that I don't have to be perfect, but I must be excellent in everything that I do. Here on Capitol Hill, I have taken these lessons and applied them to work that I have been able to complete. I have faith that the broken system we call foster care can be mended, so that future generations don't have to suffer the same pains we all have. I have faith that foster parents, social workers, and other advocates and representatives will continue the fight in making sure that every child in this great nation has what Senator Mary Landrieu calls a forever family through adoption or other permanent connections. When youth live any amount of their lives in care, it is imperative that they are educated about the services and programs that are afforded to them. Accomplishing this entails making the adults around them educated as well. The policy recommendations that I have worked on this summer to help with this can be summed up into three words. Federal Information Gateway. This gateway would not only allow for you to participate in programs like the CCAI FYI program, but also reconnect with family members like aunts and uncles and even siblings they were involuntarily separated from. Too many times youth go through and exit the system without knowing about the many resources available to them. These resources help foster youth cope with life as a foster child, and they also assist with establishing permanency and meaningful connections after care. Because my mother and grandmother have taught me to be excellent in everything that I do, I must be excellent in being a voice for those youth across the country in the foster care system. I pledge my dedication, 
diligence, and more importantly, my love to those youth in the system that need positive and meaningful connections to survive. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming out and uh, listening to us. It means a lot, a lot to me and a lot to us. When I first entered foster care at the age of 13, I never expected to end up in juvenile detention. I expected to be placed into a loving home that would give me opportunities that my abusive family never gave me. Sadly, this was not the case. I soon found out that the average foster parent did not want a teenager. This resulted in my caseworkers moving me into group homes. I remember my first group prison. I call it a group prison because it resembled, it resembled nothing like a home. It was surrounded by a large fence to prevent escape and doors within the home were magnetically locked. Foster youth within the facility were called clients. Staff treated us more like objects than like children. Basic privileges were not provided. I even, asked for, I even had to ask for toilet paper when I had, had to use the restroom. Imagine the embarrassment I felt when I had to ask staff for extra toilet paper because they only gave me a few sheets off that roll. Within these institutions were juvenile delinquents and gangs. I had to defend myself and my property on a daily basis. These incidents resulted in staff calling the police, which resulted in me crossing over to the juvenile justice system. Staff addressed this behavior differently in the group home setting than in a normal family setting. If your kids got into a minor fight, like your brother and sisters usually do, would you call the police on them? In a study that my colleagues and I designed, only 3% of average foster youth average youth have had a parent, teacher, or a coach call the police on them, compared to 40% of foster youth. Between the ages of 13 and 18, I had been to 30 group homes and institutions. It was no surprise that I found myself at the age of almost 17 in the ninth grade for the third time. This was because while I was moving from school to school, 12 high schools in total, my caseworkers in schools failed to transfer and piece together my high school credits. I was blessed to have a teacher in my 11th school recognize my struggles. Karen Parker was outraged to find out the system had put me in such a horrible position that she de demanded that my social worker in previous schools help me receive credits toward graduation. Thanks to her and my own perseverance, I graduated from high school at the age of 19. One other factor that deserves proper credit is the United States Army Reserve. I enlisted at the age of 17 under the split options program, which allowed me to attend my basic training the summer after my junior year of high school. With the skills and support of the military, I was somewhat prepared when I was forced out the system on my 18th birthday, which is exactly why out of the 11 recommendations that outlined in my report that I placed emphasis on the National Guard Youth Challenge program. This program is for youth between the ages of 16 and 19 that are at risk of not completing high school. This program focuses on eight areas, academic success, responsible citizenship, physical fitness, leadership, job skills, community service, health and hygiene, and life coping skills. The outcomes of this program are amazing. Within one year of graduating the program, 41% are, are in continual education, 47% are employed, and 9% go into the military. Furthermore, it saves the taxpayer money. It costs only $18,000 within an 18 month span compared to a juvenile facility that costs $88,000 per year per child. If we don't invest in our youth at an early age, we will spend much, much more money supporting them as adults through welfare and through prisons. Thank you. Today I'm going to read you a poem, a poem about my transitions through foster care. It's called Trash Bag in My Hands. I sit alone on my bed with a trash bag in my hands, and I try to fulfill the painful task my caseworker demands, where I have to pick and choose what is most important to see, put in the bag that would define the person in which I desire to be. I realize I have to sacrifice friendships and attachments I have grown to love, and replace them with tangible items and have to decide push comes to shove, where I have to make choices beyond my years that I know would never be presented to majority of my peers. But I look towards the future and embrace the past in which I would depart and accept the idea of beginning a hopeful new start. So I think about this while I fulfill the painful task my caseworker demands, while I sit alone on my bed with a trash bag in my hands. This poem can be related to many false care cases. 
I su succeeded within the program. I made it here to Capitol Hill. But there's many foster youth who have not. And I remember one of the cases of a seven-year-old boy within a group home. He exhibited some behaviors that were negative and has caused a lot of the residents activities in which they were not able to go to, which created resentment towards the young kid. I remember one day, a staff told two 13-year-old boys to beat up the seven-year-old kid. I remember hearing this kid cry at night, repetitively cry at night without anyone speaking on his behalf. I remember going to the administration over the group home, speaking about the issues regarding this child and everyone else who are experiencing the same problems, and it was dismissed. This child's voice was not heard, and neither was mine. These are problems that are happening every day within group home facilities, and they need to be addressed. My recommendations is that staff need to be trained. They need to be trained on active listening. They need to be able to listen to the youth and take the recommendations and put them into practice. If all staff cared for the youth and did not take it as the children are just a business for the group home, these issues would not exist. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Deshaun Jackson, and I am blessed to be here on this truly auspicious occasion. Joseph Sugarman once said, each problem has hidden in it an opportunity so powerful that it literally dwarfs the problem. The greatest success stories were created by people who recognized a problem and turned it into an opportunity. In my report, I discuss the importance of foster, foster youth developing lifelong connections and being properly equipped with the necessary skills to advance in life. Foster youth were given a permanency plan such as APLA or proxies such as congregate care and independent living. These plans limit their ability to make lifelong connections while limiting the necessary skills they need. So often we focus more on equipping the youth with necessary tasks than the skills. We teach them how to open a bank account and how to look for a job. However, we don't teach them the skills on how to manage the bank account, how to nail that interview, how to be responsible, and how to develop healthy relationships. In order to learn a skill, a task must first be reinforced. You give someone a house and money, but that will only last a moment. If you don't teach them how to take care of the house or how to budget the money, that reminds me of the saying, you can give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, or you can teach a man a fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. Nationally, you have uh, about 25% of foster youth becoming homeless, and in the state of California with the highest foster care population, 90% have reported leaving care without an adult to turn to and without the skills they need to make it. My foster dad, from the moment I stepped into his home, began to work with me, writing documentaries and listening to stories and doing these different things that were tasks but deemed to, turned out to be the skills I needed to uh, make me who I am today. I would recommend that APLA be amended so it is no longer used as a catch-all for older youth. I would encourage the states to use their Title V training dollars to provide training and life skills development for foster parents, provide enough funding for all youth who age out of care to have a CASA, and to treat foster youth as you would your own children. Before I leave, I'm reminded of, a of my, one of my favorite stories, and that is the little boy and the starfish. A, a, Older man was walking along the beach one morning, one evening, and he noticed a dance a boy, a figure dancing in the distance. And as he got closer, he noticed a little boy throwing starfish into the ocean. The starfish had washed ashore the night before, 
And the older man got closer and he said, well, what are you doing? And the young boy replied, well, I'm throwing the starfish back into the ocean. And the older man looked at him and said, you possibly couldn't make a difference. And the young boy picked up a starfish and threw it back into the ocean. And he picked up another one and he threw it back into the ocean and he said, I made a difference to this one and to this one. Foster youth represent those starfish. We have been washed ashore and we need to be picked up and thrown back into the ocean of life. With your help, we can move mountains. Thank you. By the time I had turned 19, I had moved 21 times. I wish that this was the unique part of my story, but it's not. This happens all the time to foster youth. Though I know that we cannot guarantee absolute placement stability, there are a few things that we need to do to make each move less detrimental to foster youth. Number one, we must hold permanency hearings six months sooner. Currently, states don't have to hold permanency hearings until 15 months after a foster youth comes into care. However, we know that kids in care who are in care longer than 12 months have moved over two times. Why aren't we planning for permanency before they're being moved around? Number two, we must hold transition hearings starting when a youth is 15 and then annually thereafter. We know that a youth in care at 15 is most likely to age out of care. However, states aren't required to hold transition plan hearings until 90 days prior to the youth's emancipation. We then wonder why former foster youth have unmet needs and poor outcomes after transitioning into adulthood. Number three, we must hold emancipation hearings where child welfare agencies must prove that they have met all the conditions set forth in the transition plan. Though it's a nice gesture that child wel welfare agencies make transition plans, states are not currently hold, holded, held, hold, held accountable <laughs> to these plans. I believe we need to empower local courts to get involved sooner and to promote checks and balances for the foster care system. My last recommendation focuses on accountability, transparency, and empowering foster youth. I'm recommending that the federal government create an electronic database for foster youth records, where age-appropriate youth could log on and view their own record. All too often, as youth are moving throughout the system, their records get lost, and no one knows where to turn for information about the youth. Currently, youth don't get to access their own files until after they turn 18, and at this point, it's too late to realize that there are giant gaps in information. If a database existed, it would be easier to track youth as they're moving, and youth would be empowered to be more engaged in their own cases. Keeping better track of this information is important because youth, youth need it when applying to jobs and college. Have you ever tried to get a job without a birth certificate or a social security card? Also, having access to things like former school transcripts would decrease high school dropouts. You see, for foster youth, it is often missing records that causes youth not to graduate on time. For me, I was 17 and applying to college before I knew that everything prior to my eighth grade year was missing. I had no educational records. I had no medical records. Everything was gone. Again, this is not the unique part of my story. This happens all the time to youth in care. What's unique about my story is that I only went to one high school. I was on track to graduate, and I was applying to college. I was one of the lucky ones because I just happened to catch the errors before I left the system. But what about the others? What about the other 97% of foster youth? If we expect to improve the outcomes of emancipated foster youth, we have to empower youth, and we have to empower the local courts. We have to hold systems accountable, we have to increase transparency, and we have to stop making excuses. Thank you. I grew up living with, a foster, pa with foster parents who are ranchers. Um, getting up every morning at 5.30 to feed goats was something I hated growing up. But looking back now, I realize all the life skills I learned from that particular chore. I learned responsibility, punctuality, respect for authority, and how my actions affect others. Um, by raising these goats, I learned how to run a small business, and I mean very small business. Um, 
and how to manage my money that I earned. Th this was just an example of the skills and the knowledge that I learned from my foster parents. Think back to your own childhood. Um, were there skills that you learned from your family members that you still use today? I am blessed to have foster parents that supported and guided me throughout the transitions. However, I am the exception. Over 20,000 youth emancipate from foster care each year. The current foster care system is designed with the assumption that transitioning from adolescence into adulthood happens overnight. Many of these youths do not have the support or guidance to learn the skills and knowledge needed to succeed in life. The outcomes of this population is troubling. Less than 50% of these youth graduate from high school. 75% of these youth's income is below poverty lines. And many of these youth become homeless or incarcerated before or shortly after they emancipate from care. This is why my report recommendation is to create a halfway house model for these youth. Um, this model is not for all the youth who emancipate from care, but for the youth who um, emancipate without a support system, a source of employment, youth who want to pursue higher education, female foster youth who become pregnant, and foster youth who are homeless. This model would fill the educational and life skills that the youth miss out on in care. It would be a place for youth to transition more effectively into adulthood and support with support and guidance. The facility would be a therapeutic environment that would allow the youth the ability to have independence with the mentoring and support of a case manager, a mentors, a therapist, teachers, and family specialists. This model would help these youth reframe from becoming a statistic and give them the opportunity to have a successful life. Thank you. For those of you who have children, um, would you say that you are planning on telling them on their 18th birthday that they are on their own and that you never plan on speaking to them again? I ask this for two reasons. One, because it happened to me. And two, because far too many foster youth suffer being left to transition into the world on their own when they need someone there the most. It's difficult to turn 18 and be abruptly thrown into the world without a clue of what to do next or how to even take care of yourself. The transition often goes a lot smoother if there is someone around able to just give advice or guidance. That's why mentoring is a very important resource when it comes to transitioning foster youth who are aging out of care. It improves college applicant enrollment rates among foster youth and improves accessibility to resources such as tutoring or counseling as well as increases morale. If I hadn't had mentors like my social worker there to guide me, I might not have ever made it to my first year in college. My social worker helped me to apply for school, figure out financial aid, find a job, and eventually moved me into my dorm on the first day. Not every foster youth has this kind of support, and as a result, many miss out on opportunities they never realized they had. As I said earlier, about 12% of foster youth reported last year that they received mentoring services while transitioning out of care. This number is far too low, and we can really benefit by taking the actions necessary to increase those numbers. Sometimes all it takes is just that extra push to put foster youth back on track. In my report, I say that foster youth need more than just a check. Foster youth need social support just as much as any other youth out there, and they're not getting it. So I'm asking you to support legislation like the Foster Care Mentorship Act, as well as federal and state programs that offer mentor services to foster youth. Mentoring is a highly beneficial resource for foster youth, and if it helped me, it can help others. Thank you. When I was 12 years old, I placed myself in the foster care system because of my mother's neglect and mental issues when I was a child. Once in the system, I was placed in a foster home in Los Angeles that had a school that was focused on emotional support versus academics. In high school, my mentor, Adam, made me aware of the fact that only 1% of foster youth graduate with a college degree. At 18, I began to work full time and attend a community college. From the beginning, it was apparent to me that my high school experience did not prepare me to pass remedial courses and move on to further my education. After taking algebra nine times, I finally graduated community college in 2009, seven years after enrolling. 
After this hurdle, I graduated in 2011 with my bachelor's degree in psychology, and in 2012, I graduated with my master's degree in education from Harvard. Throughout this whole process, I continuously sought out help from my caseworkers, the financial aid offices on my campuses for help funding my education. I don't know why no one over the last decade mentioned education training vouchers, or ETVs, and Chafee funds to me, but once I attended Harvard, I was made aware of that these funding streams existed. Now at age 28, after just learning of these funds, I am now too old to benefit from them. Had I received them early in my educational journey, I would have been able to work less, focus on my studies more, and thus not need to be in community college so long. Because I understand the challenges of foster youth, I have the knowledge, ability, and the passion to help many other youth in beating the odds and making it to and through post-secondary education. Far too many youth fall through the cracks of the, in the realm of higher education. In order to support more youth in foster care and obtaining a post-secondary education, Congress needs to make several changes surrounding the education training vouchers and Chafee funds. The change that is most important to me is that we amend the free application for federal student aid, often referred to as FAFSA. This to alert foster youth that they are eligible for such funds. It is important to note that the FAFSA already has a question to distinguish whether a foster youth is filling out the form. And Congress could use this question to notify youth that they may be eligible for these federal ETV funds. My report highlights that the current maximum award amount of the ETVs, which is $5,000 per youth per year, is not adequate in removing the financial burden from tuition for foster youth to attend an institution, which according to the Department of Education, on average, costs $12,000 to $20,000 per year for public two- and four-year colleges, respectively. So the current maximum amount of the ETVs is insufficient by at least $8,000 a year to help cover the cost of attending college. Lastly, Congress should consider and utilize all of the resources, facts, and figures that are presented in my report in order to support more youth in care and achieving post-secondary educational pursuits. If the system attends on aging out youth at 18 or even 21 without support, we must do a better job preparing them to be successful. I'm not asking you to do this alone. I'm willing to offer you all of my time, my experience, my passion, and my dedication in making this a possibility for all youth in care. I look forward to seeing this all unfold in the future. Thank you. It has easily happened to me. Fortunately, the number of organizations that strive to help baby sea turtles survive have done a pretty good job at protecting the turtles for the weeks they spend on the land, but mistakenly neglect the years they spend in the ocean. In comparison, the foster care system focus on, focuses on the immediate needs of the youth in care, but neglects the long-term needs required for a successful transition into adulthood. It is little wonder why we former foster youth find it so hard to succeed as adults. It's because we were not granted the opportunity to succeed as children. All of us who sit here today have heard the many stories and experiences of my fellow peers who have survived the foster care system. The test for current leaders and future leaders is figuring out what you will do as an individual to ensure future generations of foster youth will have the opportunity to successfully transition from the treacherous sandy beaches into the beautiful blue ocean. Thank you. While the FYI class of 2012 each has their own personal story to tell, they also share in a common experience. As they have just told you, this experience is more often marked by frustration than by success, more isolation than meaningful connections, and less love and support than any youth needs to, to survive. The good news is that change is coming. It is coming because youth like the ones before you are no longer sitting idle in despair, but rather having the courage to reveal their scars that have been inflicted upon them so that others will come not to have to suffer these same wounds. Their collective voice is strong, solidified over time of having to fight for the things that many of us just take for granted. And it is growing stronger. Do not leave here today under the impression that there's nothing that you can do to help. If nothing more, you can add your voice to this growing chorus and demand change. John F. Kennedy once said, each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, 
he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest of walls of oppression and resistance. I, for one, will leave here today hopeful that the walls of oppression that have too long stood in the way are about to fall. The Foster Youth Intern Program has benefited from the courageous example of many members of Congress who are not afraid to use their very powerful voices on behalf of the voiceless. Chief among them is Senator Landrieu, who will now join us and give us some closing remarks. Well, let me begin these brief remarks by just thanking the Congressional Coalition on Adoption for their extraordinary leadership and the sponsors of this event that have brought these amazing young adults uh, to Washington to help them to find their voice, to strengthen that voice, and to add such um, power and passion uh, and energy to this debate here in Washington. And I've spoken to almost each one of them at some point this summer. Had the pleasure, of course, to have Marisha in my own office, who has just turned out to be an extraordinary leader among this group. Um, and just want to tell them how happy and impressed we are and want to encourage you all on your way. So let's give them all a round of applause. And I want the staff and the leadership, Kathleen, and your staff of CCAI and the sponsors to please stand. I know you all recognize Kathleen, the CCAI team. You all wave your hands. Woo! They have loved and nurtured this group. I think they've taught them or taken them swimming. They've taken them maybe a little camping. They've been out. Uh, they've had a great time together besides coming up um, with these wonderful ideas. I want to um, just briefly follow up on what RJ said, that every one of us in here can be a Karen Parker, who at some point just got so aggravated uh, that the system was failing someone that she knew and loved that she just said enough and did something about it. We have all just heard wonderful ideas, over a dozen excellent ideas about ways that the system can be changed. So let us all today be a Karen Parker. And I don't know if she's here, is she? No, she's not. All right. <laughs> well, let us all be a Karen Parker. And whether you're a senator or a congresswoman like Congresswoman Bass or a staffer on one of these wonderful committees, or an advocate, or an attorney, or a judge, or a staffer, please do something to help change this system. I was busily taking down notes, writing ideas. Of course, we review the report. We've received an excellent report like this from each of our programs since the beginning. Many of these ideas have already been implemented into law. I know personally that several of these young advocates were able to talk their representatives and senators that they worked for this year or staff with this year to sign on to bills that are pending before the Congress so you've already had an impact. But the bottom line is the system in the United States of America is a model for the world. This is not the model that we want to show to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is really struggling with what to do. How do they empty their orphanages? How do they set up a foster care system? Despite the fact that several had pretty good experiences, the majority did not. And there's absolutely no reason why we can't intervene much earlier in doing permanency planning early as we do parallel for reunification if possible or to kinship placement to a willing and able relative or to a forever family. I mean, every child needs to try to maintain connections with their birth family, their tribal situation, or their birth family in a, um, in a community, um, uh, an outside community. But we can do a much better job than we're doing. And you know, this is 2012. I've been working on this issue literally since I was a teenager, and that was in the late 70s. So I'm happy to see some progress that we're making, but still so frustrated with the long way that we have to go. We don't need marginal change. We need radical transformation. 
and we need radical change in this system. And Wendy's wonderful kids, Rita Sorensen is here. Dave Thomas was one of my great mentors. I hope that, Rita, you'll speak up in the question and answer as I turn it over to Tabitha. But there are some strategies out there to try to perfect our reunification strategies and strengthen our birth families, and if not, to move children much earlier, much more quickly, into forever families with their sibling groups intact and to wrap our arms around them. These are our special children. We have a special obligation to these children that were uh, terminated uh, from their birth parents, mostly for very, very good reasons. But nonetheless, we do that clumsily. We do it heartlessly. We do it sloppily. We, and the ways we do it affect their ability to really be the great uh, citizens uh, that they have turned out to be miraculously and with God's help. Every time I come to one of these, I hear something that's life-changing for me, and I heard something today that is. I'll say the other thing that I heard last year. Scott Vegeta, who is a, um, an uh, NFL football player, was adopted as an infant, a traditional adoption. Um, he is now probably 285 pounds and 6 feet 7. When he was adopted, he was probably like 9 pounds. And he was adopted by um, two um, Asian American parents, neither one of them or above five feet. And so when Scott testified uh, as an adoptee and how wonderful his adoption experience was and was talking about his family that loves him and how he has to pick up his grandmother who's so little that anywhere they go he sort of just carries her because I don't think she's but about four feet. And we was talking, he said, you know, Senator, because we were talking about what a family looks like and how a family should look. He said, you know, Senator, I don't really know what a family looks like, but I most certainly know what a family feels like or what a family should look like. He said, but I most certainly know what a family feels like. And we all know what a family feels like. And we all should know what a family feels like and what a shame it is for some of our children to grow up. This on this panel, I heard something that I'm going to repeat over and over, and that is when you see a successful adult, and Talithi, I think it was you, that successful adults grow from successful children. You think about it, it's true in all of our lives. We were successful children before we were successful adults. You were a successful first grader. You were a successful fourth grader. You were a successful freshman. It's successful, I mean, succeeding and feeling a sense of well-being and confidence. If you aren't a successful child, you will not normally be a successful adult. And you can define success in many different ways, but happiness and joy and sort of doing what God created you to do or what you're called to do. It's not how much money you have or how powerful or how high you, you rise. Why is it in America that we don't think it's important to do our best to make sure that every child is being successful? We have a system that cries out for change and reform, so let's get about it. So, Talithia, I'm going to turn it over to you, and again, let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you, Senator Landrieu. I will forever remember that you quoted me. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, we're going to go ahead and turn it um, to questions and answers for our panelists. From CASA, court-appointed special advocates, which I'm not sure how many of you up there know, but we provide volunteers who advocate for children in the foster system. So this is a question for any or all of you. If you had an ideal advocate, what would they do for you in your life, and what advice could you give to an advocate to best serve a foster youth? I had a CASA uh, growing up, and well, in the foster care system, and I have to say that he was a pretty good CASA. Um, just being there, I think it was that that overall sense of him going to my graduation and going to um, an ROTC event or doing something like that. But it was that sense of family. He listened. He cared. Uh, he he really fought for me in the court aspect or the court portion of it. But it's just being there. When you think of it that way, and uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass said something so great, and that was you have to view foster youth as your own children. 
And that's how that CASA worker viewed me as his own child. He had kids, but he looked at me as his child, and that made a big difference. Before, um, I, I have recently, and I'm actually going to be swearing in in October to be one, but um, I never um, heard of it as a teenager growing up. I believe Acosta would have benefited me for the fact they knew me as a person rather than um, everybody else involved in my case to sit down and read in the paper about me that painted in such a bad, ugly picture of, of me, which I wasn't that type of person. <clears throat> so I believe uh, Acosta could have benefited me in that. It could have made recommendations in court. The probably wouldn't have got slammed in juvenile detention as much. Um, probably would have been in probation from the time I was 13 to 17, like literally I was on probation or in juvenile detention from those times. So um, that would have definitely uh, helped and uh, it would save taxpayer money uh, just having someone to listen to me. Um, and I, I definitely recommend anybody, especially within group homes that are, are at risk uh, within the inner city of being crossed over into a juvenile detention center, which I do uh, recommend in my report for uh, juveniles also have a CASA. I believe that make a great impact because they're going to not only know about you, they're going to know about your support system and your teachers and who else is involved within that child's life. And I believe that's an important picture to paint whenever you're in a courtroom and uh, the judge doesn't know anything about you or any, any other party involved. So I believe ACASA would be a very effective. Thank you. I guess it was a few weeks ago we talked about you telling your individual stories to the member to, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, when we had lunch a couple of weeks ago, we talked about you telling your stories to the individual members or key staff. And I was wondering if any of you had an opportunity to do that, and especially you, RJ. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, this is a funny story. I never thought I'd actually get to speak to my congressional member, uh, Senator Roy Blunt. He was really busy, understood his schedule about my personal story. Um, Senator Mary Landry emailed him and said, please give him at least 10 minutes every time. So my very last day in my congressional office, I actually got to sit down and speak to him. And yesterday, um, Libby, which is um, a, a staffer over in um, <clears throat> Landry's office, um, emailed me and said he co-sponsored the A-plus Act, which is an assess to papers lead to uninterrupted success. Um, <laughs> and, and for those who don't know what that is, it basically uh, amends the FERPA Act for uh, caseworkers and um, teachers to get access to to the foster kids' school records. That way they can they can transfer to each school easily without any problems. So I also I recommended that in my report, so I'm, I'm really glad that progress has been made on that. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Wonderful. Are we, we had another? Um, I didn't really get much of an opportunity to say my story uh, specifically, but during the last week uh, working in Senator Klobuchar's office, I got asked to write a policy recommendation report and include some of my experiences with my recommendations. And so um, just a couple of weeks ago, I submitted 10 policy recommendations for her. Thank you, Michael. Marshall, and then James. Um, I'm from New Jersey, but I did not intern in uh, Senator Menendez's office. I actually interned with the great Senator Mary Landrieu. Um, <laughs> although I'm not from Louisiana, she did hear my voice. She gave me many opportunities to speak to her personally about my story and uh, about my wonderful adoptive family, about my biological family, about you know my being separated from my biological siblings and I, I must say that I really do appreciate your, your lending your ear to me. It really was helpful for me. Um, and uh, I don't think it was necessary for me to speak only to my representative from my state, but I definitely think it was important. State, South Carolina, we call them guardian ad litems, not CASA members. But to be a court-appointed attorney, you need to know your youth's case. So... When I first received the guardian litem, he was an attorney and he, I didn't know his name. He was never around. And this is the person that's representing me in court on my best interest. So it wasn't until later on, I believe when I was in ninth grade, when I got my case transferred over and I got a guardian litem who was a volunteer. And a person actually came, did monthly visits with me and got to know me personally and what I think would have been good in my situation. So take that in consideration, actually having direct contact with the youth. Thank you, James. Can I yes. One thing, if I could, just to encourage the staff that are here, because there are many, many powerful staff here. All senators and congressmen 
and women have interns. And of course, we can't spend individual time with each one of our interns. I have 16 interns during the summer. So I can't spend individual time and long sessions with them, but I do get to meet them and take a picture, et cetera. And that's customary for the members. But these are special FYIs. These are special interns. And I really want to push the staff here to next year make sure that each of these interns gets at least five minutes with the member and the chief of staff or the member. Because these are powerful stories. And part of this whole program is getting this voice into the member's head because everybody thinks they know what foster care is. Congresswoman Bass and I know a lot about foster care because we deal in it day in and day out. We pretty much know it even though we learn new things every day about it. We are continuing to learn, but many members don't know about the foster care system. So it was wonderful. I mean, it was really God that did that because I was so moved by RJ's story. I just said, okay, that's it. Exactly. I'm going to get one with, you know, and I, I just did it. But everybody can do that. You know, just give them five minutes. They deserve five minutes, don't you think, after yeah. what they've been through? Mm -hmm. I think we have a question here. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Trace Red. Um, I'm not. I'm a former Fox Chief myself, and a 2011 Fox Club All Star. My question is, is kind of to get to know them, the interns, a bit more personally, since everyone is from a different uh, state. Um, what was one thing that you enjoyed about DC over the summer? Because it's, it's pretty crazy here in the summertime, as most people know. So, yes, yeah, hot, and you know, with the festivals and everyone on more protesting. What was your favorite thing over the summer? I'll go ahead. Okay, so there is a lot of things that I really enjoyed about being here this summer, but I think what I'm going to take away the most is seeing um, both parties work together in order to make the system better. And I got an opportunity to really work with the Office of Congresswoman Karen Bass and sit in a lot of the meetings um, with Jenny. And like I said, just to see the bipartisanship was amazing. And truly, when you see, especially in election year, there's a lot of fighting. This is really an issue where um, people do come together and try to make it better. So that was amazing to see. I think one of the things that really stuck out to me this summer that I've enjoyed is just the fact that DC is such like a big city, but it's really a small town. Like you could really run into anyone anywhere. So um, I just experienced that the other night, running into someone who works at the White House. And I was just at like a small hole in the wall restaurant. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. So it's a, I think that you could really make some great connections and build really strong relationships. I know I have with many of the people on this panel. So that's one thing that stuck out to me. Mine would be, you know, you see the senators and you see congressmen and women on TV and you come here. And uh, one instant happened, it was my last week, I was passing by there, Senator Grassley, and he waved, and I looked behind me, and I was like, who's he waving at? And he goes, you're that foster kid. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and after numerous, new, and it, you know, I didn't care he knew my name, I just knew, knew that inside, that he knew who I was after coming up to the hill so many times, and with Senator Landry and Congresswoman Bass, just to see her face every day. And, you know, not a lot of interns get to see that and to interact and get pictures. And, you know, it might not be mean, you know, meaningful to you guys, but it's meaningful to us interns because we're like, wow. And I go back to my office and I'm like, I got to see Senator Landry's house. <laughs> and so, um, and so that was really, really cool to come out here and interact with the champions of foster care and to be able to know that, you know, our voice is being heard and loud through you guys on the floor. For me, two things. I would have to say one of my favorite things is the architecture. I just love everything in DC. I'm just like, oh my god, picture, picture, picture. Everywhere I go, you can ask them. I'm like crazy with the camera. One day I would like to build a house that looks like the Capitol. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> and then the second would have to be working with the Committee on Ways and Means. An experience I will never have again is like seeing how a bill is made. I mean, you can read a book to your blue in the face to see how everything is done out here, but really you don't know until you have stepped foot on Capitol Hill. So, um, I think I have kind of two as well. My first would definitely be all the opportunities that I was able to have with um, Senator Landrieu's office 
she had receptions at her home and she just invited all of her interns pretty much everywhere. And so we got so much experience to just be around her and to interact with her. So that definitely just interacting with the people that are making laws and doing things that are changing people's lives. It's definitely a, a blessing to be able to have that experience with her. And um, also being here during the healthcare passing and the the Restore Act passing, it was just amazing for me. This is stuff my siblings are going to see in their textbooks, and I'll be able to say, I was there that day. I saw that happen. I was in front of the Supreme Court when that happened. So definitely those two experiences are definitely on the top of the charts. Uh, I'll probably sound like a geek saying this, but I love the hearings. Uh, <laughs> um, I, yes, yes. But the summer during the weekends with the youth leadership school. So um, that's built up my resume, and I landed a, a Senate, a state Senate staffer position when I get back home. So I'll be working in the state Senate back in my home state of Missouri. So, thank you, guys. Making me blush there. You guys are stuff that. So thank you, guys. I have to say I have two things as well. Um, one of the things was just being around like CCAI staff because, I mean, it, <laughs> I'm actually an aspiring law student. I'm actually starting law school in August, and like majority of the staff are like attorneys. So I, I like the expertise and all that kind of stuff that they're able to give me advice regarding my report. And also the second is just being around all of these different interns who have experienced the foster care system and from different locations around the world. I mean, I mean, well, United States. But, <laughs> I mean, just being able to have that close connection and be able to go back to our areas and spread our voices about the different foster care issues that we have, I think that's just amazing. I would have to say as well two things. One is I live in Las Vegas, so getting used to this uh, wet heat would be <laughs> one of them. But most importantly, um, I, I, I'm fascinated with history, and I uh, get the I have the opportunity to work with the legislation in Nevada. But to come to D.C. and to meet the congressmen and women and the re representatives and the senators, I mean, it's so much rich history, and it's so much that you can just I mean you literally walk out the door and you're standing next to history. And I think that's the most fascinating thing to be able to do. But also, like they reiterating, you know, being able to sit in some of the, um, the sessions or to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with some of the uh, representatives. Uh, we took a picture of this before we sat at, at the panel with uh, Congresswoman uh, Bass. And it's just like that's a celebrity to a celebrity to us. And it's amazing because we don't get to interact uh, that much with anyone uh, with, with such power, but with also with such grace. And that's the most beautiful and amazing thing. So DC has been great. It truly has been. Thank you. I also am going to miss many things about DC, and I feel like it's really hard to narrow that down. So I have two categories of things. <laughs> um, one is all of the, the art and culture DC has to offer, jazz in the park, screen on the green, the Smithsonian's. I feel like there's something new every day to experience and, and to learn from, and I think that that's amazing. And then my second category is the people here. I feel like in every place that I've been in DC, whether it's been in the Senate Finance Committee or CCAI or within our group, I've, I felt like people have really invested their time in me and have not only listened to me, but there's been a mutual exchange of stories and like that's something I'm gonna take with me. I'm, I'm going to remember the Zen master and I'm going to remember um, the, the conversations about families and turning stones and, and all of that. I'm, I'm going to take that with me um, wherever I go from here. What I'm gonna remember most is the relationships I've made with the CCAI staff and the staff from my office. And just working in my congressional office was amazing. Even though I do the interny things where they just kind of throw things at me, but I just love just being needed and being asked for advice on foster care reform or anything that has to do with that. And I don't know, I just liked it a lot. Um, any, any of these other Foster Youth interns or the CCAI staff all know very well how proud I am of my home state. 
Um, and and that's that's the main reason why I have to say that my favorite part of the summer being here in D.C. has been working at the Honorable Senator Klobuchar's office because I've done so many things in the past where I've I've tried sending letters and messaged her uh, through uh, through the mail or through phone calls and worked with other groups in the state and then finally just coming out and working for her has been a wonderful experience. So I guess for me, um, I'm from California and was never a part of anything foster care related. Um, it just never happened to me. I asked and asked. I don't. I don't. I didn't even Google. I should have Googled. Now that I learned, you could Google foster care and stuff will come up. But um, <clears throat> my favorite part would definitely be Kathleen and CCI. Um, I was at Harvard when I applied to this internship, and immediately when I applied, I didn't even care about Harvard anymore. I wanted to be a CCI. Um, so I'm just happy for the experiences I've gotten with that. And um, my office was really nice to me. I rarely did anything interny um, unless I volunteered to do it. I had lots of special projects I got to work on, anything foster related with Megan. So um, I just remember all those memories and everything I learned. Thank you. And I have to echo Michael. I love California. There's no place like home. But while being in D.C., I will say D.C. has the best Forever 21. So, <laughs> I know, right? But um, as far as my office is concerned, I was with the Senate Finance Committee with Russ and some of my uh, staff staffers. Wow, Talitha, come on out. Some of the people I work with. Um, and just that experience of being thrown into something with 10% of the information and having to produce 90% um, of work. So um, I appreciate just being with people who understood the struggle and not uh, make me really feel like an intern, but they made me feel like I was somebody who mattered. So thank you. Other questions? We have about five minutes, three to four to five minutes. Yes. First, good afternoon. I would like to thank everyone on the panel for sharing their story. My name is Byron Jackson. I'm also with CASA DC, and I um, work with our advocates who focus on ODU, specifically transitioning. I had the opportunity to speak with Marissa uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to share this comment and question with everyone else. I'm noticing when transition planning is occurring that there's not a strong enough focus on education, specifically post-secondary education. And I'm just one, and I noticed that everyone's bio, everyone is a college graduate. So I just want to know, one, how was your experience with um, post-secondary education as far as it being proposed to you during transition? And also, what supports can be put in place to ensure that once a foster youth enters into college or any post-secondary institution that they will actually succeed? I'll go ahead and start and then We'll have Christina. Um, I graduated from Cal State Fullerton just this May um, with my degree in human services. But when I was with my aunt, which was my last placement um, from the ages of 14 to 18, my only goal, like I said in the beginning, was to emancipate the foster care system. So being placed in her home gave me the stability as well as she was a prior college graduate, so she understood the importance of education in which she instilled that into me. So I think that's very key because a lot of us, that's not on our minds, that's not on our radars, is to go to college until somebody who has been through that is able to you know, give us knowledge and give us you know, a valuable um, experience or their experience um, instilled in us. So my recommendation or advice would be to connect more youth with people who have been through the education system. Christina. I was very blessed because when I exited the foster care system, um, my CASA worker gave me a, she filled out everything for the CHAFI. So when I went to my financial aid office, everything was already set. But I think what really got me through my, um, to, through my bachelor's degree was the support that I got um, from the, the shelter home where I lived in when I was in foster care. Um, really, they helped out with my housing, um, and they just really worked around my school schedule and allowed me to go to school and, um, and work. And I know currently we are working on a Guardian Scholars program. Um, I know they're very well known in California. I don't know how many other states have them, but um, they just seem to be pretty successful uh, 
really supporting the youth. It's not just about like, here's money. It's like the intense support of like, hey, this is where you can go if you need to speak to someone in regards to financial aid. If you, someone to help you select your classes, because you know, as Talitha mentioned, unless you have someone in your life who has done this before, you really, like, we don't know. And like I said, I was very blessed. Vicki Murphy, who's my boss and like a mother to me, um, has been amazing in guiding me and helping me through this. So um, just to answer your questions, I think programs like the Guardian Scholars Program really would, to have that intense support for foster youth would help out. Thank you, Christina. And um, to respect time, we're gonna hear from Marissa in our last um, answer. Well, I mean, if you read my report, it's all about post-secondary education, um, but Two things I would definitely recommend you help youth with is, A, let them know up front it's hard. It's going to be hard. It's the way it is. And, and let them know that they have your support to lean on when it gets hard. Because um, I feel like knowing that only 1% graduated was a plus and a minus. How am I going to be the other nine? And back then, when I'm older than all these people. So back then, it, um, it was 1%. It's now 3%. That's not a big increase. So I would definitely let them know it's going to be hard. Take their time. Try not to work so hard. I mean, I worked full time and went to school full time. So... That's why my grades took forever. I would also say, though, too, funding would be super great. I, I'm glad Christina had somebody fill out a form. I never heard of Chafee ETV. I've paid for all my education. I paid algebra nine times myself. So um, I would definitely say finances is amazing because if you don't have to worry about paying for it, you have more time to study for it. And with all of our transferring around and moving around, you need that extra time to study. So let them know it's hard. Let them know to study their butts off. They can do it. Yes. And so uh, now I just want to thank you all for the support of the Foster Youth Internship Program. And we um, would like to celebrate this moment with a few um, refreshments at the end. And if you would like to further um, talk to any of the FYIs, please feel free to do so at that time. So on behalf of CCAI, we thank you for all attending and thank you for hearing us now.